this morning. Good morning, everyone. We're going to be in Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 26, if you want to go ahead and turn there. Uh, let's, let's pray this morning. Father, we come to you. We thank you, Lord, that as we come to your word, Lord, that you're here to speak to us and to encourage and to sharpen us. And so, Lord, we lean in this morning. God, we don't want to go through motions or through a ritual or just another service, but we ask for your presence and the spirit of the Lord to be with us in this place this morning. God, we confess our need for you, to hear from you, to commune with you, and for you to speak to us, to make us more like you. So we just ask that you would have um, your way in this time. I ask that you would speak, Lord, that you would cover me in humility, and Lord, that this time would be a time that would honor you. And so we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, during the Reformation time, um, there was a man named Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli, like the other leaders, Martin Luther and John Calvin, um, they sought to address what they saw as corruption and unbiblical practices within the, the Roman Catholic Church or the church as a whole at that time. And one of the central debates um, that was primary at that time that they had was over the nature of the Eucharist or the, the Lord's Supper. In the Catholic tradition, the Eucharist was seen as the literal body of Christ, the literal blood of Christ through a doctrine of, of what is still known as transubstantiation. And that's just like a $4 word for a means to change substance. Um, but they believe that the bread and the wine were transformed during the mass. And the phrase that the priests would say when they were partaking and, and giving communion um, in Latin as they gave the bread was hocus corpus meum, meaning this is my body. And this is actually where we get the phrase hocus pocus from. Um, because as, as, as the people in the congregation, they didn't know Latin. And so they would hear this and they, were, they would kind of mockingly say as the, the priests were, were speaking Latin over that they were performing magic and turning the, the, the bread into, into the body. Um, but for Luther, and especially the early church, the celebration of the Eucharist, the celebration of communion and the Lord's Supper was one of the most sacred and, and, and the holiest of, of, of acts um, as they would gather together and worship. And it was always the table in which the, the, the room was built around. The Lord's table was always the very center in the altar where the priests would consecrate the elements. But Zwingli, who was a Swiss reformer, he rejected this understanding of the Eucharist he viewed that the Lord's Supper was just a symbolic uh, act of remembrance rather than a, a, a mystery of what was taking place. His thought um, was that the bread and the wine just was symbols of Christ's body and blood, but didn't actually really contain his real presence. And he believed this so much that this, this, the, the real act and, and central part of the Christian life should not be a, um, the, the communion or the, the body and the blood, but it should be the proclamation of the word of God. In his view, the people of God should be nourished not by bread and wine, but by the hearing and understanding of scripture. Um, and to emphasize this in a very dramatic fashion, in one of the services, Zwingli physically removes the altar table out of the center of the room, and in it, he places the pulpit. And this was the first time that that had ever happened. Um, and this change reflected that his belief in the preaching of the word should take precedence over the sacraments of the Eucharist. And he wanted to shift the congregation and, and reform um, people's attention from what he thought were just superstitual rituals to the clear teachings of, of the gospel. And I want to say this morning that all, all those Wingley's passion for the gospel and for the centrality of scripture, which I, I believe that that is a, was a beautiful bringing back to in a, in a swinging of a, of a balance that needed to take place. Um, I believe that what he did was um, actually a ripple effect into what we have today of a downplaying of the Lord's table. Um, I believe that many believers today um, either had this misunderstanding of what communion is or really don't even partake in it at all. And, and for Luther... And for the early church, this, this was such a, um, a shift that they, didn't, they, they never saw taking place. And, and as we go to our passage this morning, I'm praying for the Lord to help us recover 
a holy sense of what the Lord's table is really supposed to be in our lives. That Jesus, he's gonna say that he earnestly desired to eat this meal with us. And that um, as we spend time this morning, I'm praying that we can return to the holiness and, and a mystery and the power of what the bread and the wine is, not just symbols, um, but a powerful encounter with the real presence of Jesus this morning. So let's turn to our text. This is again, Mark chapter 14, verses 22. It says, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they drank of it. And he said to them, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of heaven. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Last week, we, if you remember, we read that Jesus and his disciples, they had just previously been in the town of Bethany right outside of the, the city of Jerusalem and had been uh, staying there. But um, they are back in Jerusalem now and they are in what is known as the, the week in the time of Passover. Um, if you remember Peter and, and John, they go to Jesus and they ask him, uh, the, for instructions about what Jesus wanted them to do in Jerusalem and where they were going to eat and uh, where they were going to have room to be able to take Passover. And so for, for the disciples and for, for really the whole Jewish nation, this wasn't just like a normal dinner. This wasn't just another like time for them to eat, but this was, this was like almost like a Thanksgiving celebration where everybody had planned to be there. Everybody had a specific place and they were going to spend the, this dinner together going over what is known as the Passover. And it's here that Jesus is intentionally going to use this moment, this dinner, this night as a, as a last supper with all of his disciples um, and is going to choose to institute what was his last supper, but was going to be the very first Lord's Supper that we would know. And in, in some way, the Passover and the Lord's Supper have this connection. Although they're, they're not exactly the same, there are very much things that are intertwined between the two. And it's almost impossible not to talk about the background and the origin of what the Passover is when we're talking about what communion is. And so... Back in the book of Exodus, we're told that the nation of Israel was enslaved in the nation of Egypt. And God raises up a man named Moses as a prophet. And God is going to use Moses to deliver Israel out of bondage and take them back to their homeland. And so Moses, as a man of God, confronts Pharaoh and God empowers Moses um, with these supernatural signs um, for the nation of e Egypt. And he, Moses, as, as God empowers him, brings about plagues and really more than what they were, where they were, they were signs of judgment against Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt for refusing to turn from the sin, from the hardness of their heart and f against uh, freeing God's people. And so the final act of this judgment that um, God is, is, is putting upon the nation of Egypt, God gives Moses very specific instructions for Israel. God says that he is going to send an angel of death to kill the, the firstborn of every Egyptian family. But God tells Israel that you will not suffer this consequence if you put the blood of the lamb without blemish across the doorposts of their homes. And that if you put the blood of the lamb over the doors of their homes, that the angel of death will pass over you. And this is the origin of the Passover feast that Jesus and the disciples are now eating to remember uh, the passing over of the angel of death over the Israelites. And so every year, even beginning back in the wilderness, this was God instructed the nation to remember this, this event, to remember the Passover and to celebrate it with a feast. And so even in the wilderness, this is what they would do so that for generations to come, they would never forget what God had done for them. And so again, Jesus is here in the last week of his life, in the last days of his life. And it just so happens to be a night of the Passover. And whether you think that's a coincidence or not, I, I'm not sure it is. I think that there was intentionality of, of this moment and this night. And so the verse is that as they ate, 
as they're eating this Passover meal, it says that Jesus took the bread, he blesses it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them and told them that it was his body. And during the meal, the Passover meal, there would have been in uh, bread, unleavened bread on the table to remind them of the kind of bread that the Israelites had to eat as they were escaping Egypt, that there was such a hurriness and they were in such haste that they were not able to bake the bread like normal to let it rise with the yeast, but there was unleavened bread. And so they would use unleavened bread on the table to have this picture of their mind of what was taking place. And the head of the family was responsible during this dinner uh, to take the bread, to bless it and break it, saying this, that this is the bread of affliction, which our forefathers ate in the land of Egypt. Whoever is hungry, let him come and eat. Whoever is in need, let him come. And it was here as the disciples are eating the remaining bread that Jesus takes it and he says, look, look, just like this bread is being broken, my body is going to be broken and sacrificed for you. He's taking this moment, he's looking at them and he's saying, look at this bread. I want you to look at this bread and realize that this is my body that is going to be broken, that I'm now making this bread of remembrance to be a remembrance of my body. I'm I am telling you again of what is about to happen, that I am going to die, I'm going to suffer. My body is going to be beaten. My back is going to be whipped with a scourge that I'm going to be beyond recognition. And I'm doing this so that you can take of me, that whoever is hungry, let them come to me and eat, that whoever is in need, let them come and find me. And so now this bread, I want you to take and I want you to remember that my body is being beaten for you and that you could be made whole instead. And I believe that the, the disciples, as they're hearing this, they, they probably would remember that Jesus along the way had already been kind of using this language. Uh, John chapter six, Jesus said that for my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. And it was when Jesus said this, this, this kind of jarring language um, at a time where there were, there were thousands of people with him that Jesus was helping to feed with loaves and fishes. And it says that when people heard Jesus say this, that many of them turned away. That many of them heard this language and, 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 rem, and kind of just had to walk away from Jesus. But the disciples, as, as they're close to Jesus, Jesus says, what about you? Are you going to turn from me as well? And and this is where they say that, no, but where else can we go? But you have the, the words of life for us. And so Jesus is saying this again, that my flesh is true food. My blood is true drink. Now, just as you eat bread in the natural to nourish your body, Jesus is saying, when you come to this table now, and when you come and eat this bread, I will come and I will nourish you. I will give you grace. I will strengthen you as you remember me, that I want you to remember that I am your source of life, that I am your sustenance, and I will give you strength when you take and eat of this bread. So do you see this? Do you see how this is already taking place, that, that he's taking the bread and he's using it for something completely different? And then it says that he took a cup, he gave thanks, and they drank. He says that this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. So after the bread, Jesus does the same thing with the cup. He says, just as this cup of red wine is poured out, so my blood is shed for you. And again, this is the Passover meal that they're eating. They're remembering the blood of a lamb that was shed so that they could be able to put the blood on the doorposts of their homes so that the angel of death would go over them. And Jesus is saying, listen, I am the fulfillment of this. I am the ultimate Passover lamb. I am the lamb of God that was shed for you, that now the blood is over the doorposts of your heart and that the sin, the judgment, the angel of death is going to pass over you as you retrust in me that my blood was shed for you, that no longer are you gonna to have to be under the judgment of sin, but you can have life for you, that I am the fulfillment of this. And, and, and then he says something that the cup is going to stand for a new covenant. And what did he mean by this? What did he mean by the cup would stand for a new covenant? The word covenant is a common word 
in, in the Jewish religion. The, the basis of their religion was, was that God had entered into a covenant with Israel. The word means to be in a, an arrangement, a bargain, or some sort of a relationship. Uh, William Barclay, a scholar, said, said this, that the acceptance of the old covenant is set out in Exodus chapter 24. And from that passage, we see that the covenant was entirely dependent on Israel keeping the law. If the law was broken, the covenant was broken, and the relationship between God and the nation shattered. It was a relationship, it was a covenant entirely dependent on law and on obedience of law. God was judge. And since no man can keep the law, the people were ever in default. But Jesus says, listen to this, but Jesus says, I am introducing and ratifying a new covenant, a new kind of relationship between God and man. And it is not dependent upon law. It is dependent on the blood that I will shed for you. And the point, the point here, church, is that this new covenant is solely based upon love. Jesus is saying, what I am going to do for you, I'm going to give my body as a sacrifice. I'm going to allow it to be broken. I'm going to let my blood be poured out for you. And I'm going to suffer on a cross to show you how much God loves you. That you were once under a law that was a law of condemnation, that crushed, that was something that no one could fulfill, but I am going to fulfill the law and be sacrificed and my blood will be shed for you so that you can experience the love of God instead of the law. That you no longer have to live under the weight of law or the condemnation of sin and the judgment of God because what I am going to do, you will forever be within the love of God. And later, this, this, is, this is the most beautiful part that I want us to hear this morning, that the early church, when they would gather together and they would take communion, they would center themselves around a table. They didn't call it a gathering. They didn't call it a Sunday morning service. Do you know what they called it? They called it a love feast. They really believed that communion was given for us to remember, as Jesus said, his body and blood given for us to celebrate his death and resurrection. But it was also a time for them to come together in unity and in love with one another under the love of Christ. They believed that this table was a time to show real agape, selfless love. And they, this, this meant a couple of things. This, this means that when we would come to the table, that we would know one another's needs, that we would care for one another when we were in need, and that we would give sacrificially to those that had, had lack, that needed food, that needed care, that there was an understanding that we would come together and that we would be able to look at one another in the eye and know exactly what's going on in each other's lives, but we were doing it underneath the love of Christ that he, he made a space for us to do this. And it was because they really loved each other that there was this unity within the, the early church. And this unity that said that it doesn't matter if you're rich, doesn't matter if you're poor, doesn't matter your status in, the, in, in society. You could be Jew, you could be a Gentile, you could be a slave, you could be a master. Didn't matter the hierarchy of power in which you had. But when you came to this table that there was unity and equality for all because of the blood of Jesus that was shed for each and every one of us, that it made us all equal at this table. They celebrated Christ's love that brought them together because Jesus is that I am making this a new covenant for you, a new covenant for you, for all. And so one of the questions that we should be asking ourselves this morning is, is, is communion an active part of our lives? As pastors, as, as elders of, of this church, um, we believe that communion is is so important that we, we really do. Listen, we try to make it a weekly part of our services here so that you can partake in communion. If you come to our prayer meetings, Wednesday night, Sunday night, what are we gonna do? We're taking communion. Once a month, every, the first Sunday of, of every month, we're taking communion because it's something that we feel so strongly that needs to be a central part of our Christian life again, that, that we, 
We are missing something when we're walking through our Christian life and we're forgetting the blood and the body that was broken and shed for us. And that, that just like we, we need the sustenance of the word to form us, to shape us, to be our worldview, we have to let the, the communion, the Eucharist, the Lord's table be a place in which we routinely go to every day. To, it's almost like the, the, the distractions of a sheep when they go off it, and the shepherd would use a staff to kind of smack them back in line. It, for me, the, the communion, the Lord's table is that same thing. It helps me to, in my life of being distracted, bring me back to a place of what my life is really about and centered on, upon Jesus, that, that I need this reminder daily in my life. And so, so some of you may have no idea why you take it. And, and I'd like to give you um, with, with the remainder of our time this morning, some of the reasons why and how we should come and take communion because it is such an active part of our life here, okay? Um, one of the first things Paul says to the Corinthians when they come to the table, and the Corinthian church was a hot mess, okay? They, when they were coming to, to take communion together, it said that a lot of them were coming and they were just pigging out on the food. They were drinking the wine while there were poor people. Um, and it really, it became a, a point of frustration for a lot. And so Paul is addressing, he's giving them very clear instructions. And one thing we can see with this is that, that, that Paul, who was not at the table originally with Jesus, knew what the Lord's Supper was. And so we can see that there, this was something that was instituted in, a, in a, an important part of the early church at Christian life that Paul is now saying to a church in Corinthians that when you guys come and take communion, there are very specific things that, that we need to come and, and, and do. And one of the, the first things that he says that you should do is that when you come to this table, you should examine yourself. This is in, in 1 Corinthians, um, Paul says, whoever therefore eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself and then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Hear that. Let a person examine himself and then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have even died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. And when we are judged by the Lord, we are dis disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Just li listen to that for a, a, a second and let that settle in that some of, some of the, the problems that the Corinthians church was having is that they were coming into such a, a mess to the Lord's table, which is a holy and sacred thing. And they were doing it in such an unworthy manner that it says that some of them even were sick became ill and died. That, that is just, that's what was scripture teaches. And I think that there's a weightiness there that we should hear. That, that, that one, that sin is a serious thing to the Lord. That it's, sin is a serious thing because the blood in the body of Jesus is also a very serious thing. And there should be something in our hearts that allow us to kind of feel the, the gravity and the weight of when we come to the Lord's table, that there should be an examining of our hearts before him. We need to ask ourselves some, some questions that, am I receiving this cup in an unworthy manner? Is there sin in my heart that I, I need to confess, that I need to, to get out of my heart and my life and I need to confess it to the Lord? I need to confess it to a brother, to someone else? Am I treating other people well? Do I, do I really fully understand the, this, this gospel? Do I understand the the weight of the cross, to understand the blood and the body of Jesus being broken and shed for me, that, in, that it, it means something for me, that it's not about how good of a person I can be or how many good works I can do to outweigh the bad, but that I, I can't earn this. I can't earn the, the free gift of grace and salvation of what Jesus did on the cross for me. Like, am I treating this as a holy moment, or am I coming with a flippant attitude? Am I coming out of just routine and a mundane mindset and instead of coming to the table of the Lord 
with, with, with a serious, somber, holy moment, believing that as I come, I'm going to encounter Jesus's presence in a very real way, that this isn't just symbols, this isn't just physical matter of, of, of bread and wine, but this is something that represents something so monumental in history that it changed everything. Like this is something that I need to come and believe that as I'm partaking, I am partaking in the presence of Jesus. These are probing questions that we need to examine our hearts and our conscience with. And, and the point is not that we would come and, and, and it would be so weighty that we would never take communion or hide from communion, but rather what Paul is saying again, he's saying, examine yourself. If there's sin in your life, confess it to another, be healed and then take of the Lord's table, take it and receive the grace so that you can receive forgiveness, that you can be strengthened. You commit yourself once again to living a holy life and being washed by the Holy Spirit and communing with him and working out sanctification in your life. This is what Paul's saying. He said, don't shy away, but come and, and let the Lord work in your life, that this is the Lord's desire in your life, for that you would come and partake and, and receive his strength and sustenance that Jesus is saying that is found in the, in the bread and the wine. So a couple of reasons of, of again, why, why, do we, why do we do this? One, we do to celebrate. We, we, we remember, just like the Passover meal was an act of remembrance of the Passover of, of death over the Israelites. We do this to remember and celebrate the cross. And again, I, I said this earlier, but we need to continually remember. I need to daily remember the sacrifice of Jesus's death and what that means for me that this gospel, that the gospel of the cross is the only gospel that is going to transform hearts and lives for eternity. And it is so central. It is the most central thing to our faith. And again, just, just like sheep that get so distracted, communion can be like that, that rod of the shepherd to get our attention again, to come back and to submit ourselves to again and to the, the, the reason of, of why we celebrate and remember it is, is and that it conveys his, his grace to us, his mercy to us, and how it's his body and his blood that, that benefits us. There's a benefiting as I come and take of, of a mystery, somehow that it changes us because the, the new covenant is here. It's done. The, what the work of the cross is done. So we come to celebrate and remember, but we also come because we believe that as we come, again, this is, this is what I was trying to talk about with Zwingli, Zwingli earlier, that, that he rejected this idea that there was something that there was supernatural taking place to communion. And so he removed it from, from the, the center of, of, of worship. But there is a reality that when we come and take communion, that we are receiving from Jesus himself, that our, our, our bodies are being nourished but our souls are also being strengthened by his grace and his presence that we receive his God's forgiveness as we examine ourselves, that there's something that is taking place as we take communion and that in that communion with him, what intimacy is there that we get to walk with him? There's an intimacy that Jesus himself is inviting us to, to come and to be with him. And that, I just believe that any time that we come and we encounter Jesus, that things happen in our lives, right? That, that when you come on Sunday morning and when you stand in the presence of God and you worship and you sing, that, that there's, there's something that is actually taking place that because you, this is what you were created for, that you were created for the intimate place of knowing Jesus and him knowing you and him forming and speaking to you and making you more like him, that this is why we were created. And this is something that we all long for and it's in communion that Jesus has come, take, eat, drink of me. And we encounter him. And lastly, the, the, the reason why we, we, we do this is again, just like the early church, as they called it a love feast, we get to participate in a beautiful union. Communion is a place for believers to have common union and not division. To become divisive, um, about doctrine surrounding uh, communion is, is actually really misunderstanding the act altogether. Like this was, this was kind of Zwingli's, I, th I think, mistake in, in trying to make this a divisive issue was that it was actually supposed to be something that it was the very unification of the believers to come together 
And, and it should be a, an act all about friendship and equality and union that we have. And um, earlier I was, I was studying this passage with, with some of the guys and there's um, Dr. Fred had, a, had just a phrase that kind of stuck out to me. He said that when we identify what we have in common, then we can have unity. When we can find and identify what we have in common, the fact that we were all sinners and we were all broken, but the, the blood of Jesus was all shed for us and that we were all made equal now, then we can come together and have actual unity in the name of Jesus. That, that this, this is something that I, I really believe. I believe that, that just like, man, we can have such incredible relationships and friendships with one another because we have similar commons and interests. Um, there's something that happens when you find a, a brother or a sister in Christ that you have absolutely nothing in common, but, but what you have in Jesus binds you together, right? Like if you want to look at me and you want to look at Pastor Caleb, we are two totally different, like completely different people. I, I didn't grow up in Florida. I didn't, he grew, Caleb grew up in, uh, and played heavy, like hardcore music. And so the first time I met Pastor Caleb in Bible college, I remember, I remember the moment so well. I, I walked up with who was my roommate and he introduced me to, to Pastor Caleb. And he was sitting in, in one of the pew chairs with his leg propped up and had this like, like hardcore shirt, Vans. I'd never seen Vans before. And, and, and like, I was like trying to like be friendly and kind, but he just was like, kind of like super chill. So I'll, like what I found out, he was, you know, just very like, um, not an extrovert at all, very introverted. And so me, I'm a little bit more of an extroverted, but, but nothing, nothing in the natural um, would say that Caleb and I would become friends, right? I, I, I played different sports than he did. I, I did. I grew up in a completely different area in Montana. My, our families are completely different. But when we begin to spend time with one another, and I began to realize that I have found a brother whose heart was so burning for Jesus like mine was. And I found someone who would, would lay their life down for Jesus and for the gospel and for other people that, that, that was the same thing that I desired to do. The, the unity that I began to find within Caleb as a brother became something that was more, more important than this, what sports we liked. It became more important than what kind of food we like to go do or what we like to do to hang out. But there was a kindredship in, in, in our brotherhood because of what Jesus had done for the both of us. And that there was nothing that either one of us could have done to really help us make us become more friends. But it was because of the love that we had for Jesus. It was the love that we had for him and that Jesus had for us that helped us become these brothers that, that, that it's the most meaningful relationship that I have. And it's the same for each one of us. That as we come together, and it's not the, 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 the things that we have in common necessarily, because I'm sure there's so many different things that we all come from. But it's because of the blood of Jesus that we can come underneath this morning that we have unity with one another. That as we, as we pour our heart and our life and our worship and our love out for Jesus and we do it together, there's a unity in this that is the most beautiful thing that is unlike anything in the world. And so we should, when we come together, church, I believe this is that we should come and we should come to desire to come to the Lord's table and to come and to pour our love and our, our affection and our worship because Jesus is worthy of it. But we're also doing it because I know the person ne sitting next to you is doing the exact same thing. And that encourages us, that strengthens us, that, that when I've been in the low places of my life and I've been, I've been on my own, I know I can't just quit living on Jesus because I know Caleb is somewhere else singing to Jesus, burning for him. And there's this desire in my heart that now to go, no, I can do this too. I wanna love Jesus well. And so there should be this encouragement in us as a church this morning that, that when we come together and we experience the presence of God settle upon us, that we, our hearts are caught up in this love for him, but love for one another and to encourage each other to continue to press on. Amen. Does this make sense? There, there's a unity that takes place when we find that this is what we have in common. And it's, it's easy to miss this. But again, this is, this is why Paul was so upset with the Corinthian church. He's saying, some of you are coming and you're eating all of the food. You are getting drunk on all the wine and you are completely missing what this is all about. You're missing the fact that there's poor people that have nothing to eat and you are, you are so self-engorged upon something else that you're missing the, the fact that you could be dwelling together in unity and taking care of one another. Paul says a big part of why you do this is so that you sit at a table together and you look in each other's face with love and in holiness, you encourage one another to, to press on. 
You know, Paul would say, can't you just go home and eat? Can't you just go home and do the things that you're doing right here? This moment is supposed to be something that's holy to him. So worshiping, if you guys, if you guys wanna come, we're gonna get ready to, to close this morning. The last thing Jesus says to his disciples, he says, I won't drink of this cup. And he's speaking of the last cup that there's coming a day in the final kingdom that Jesus is going to sit at a table with all of us and all will be made right. And he will drink the last cup of iniquity and that there will be no more tears. There'll be no more pain or sorrow and that we can have final peace and rest with him. And Jesus was saying this and he was certain of two things. He knew he was gonna die, but he also knew that his kingdom was going to come that Jesus was, was certain of the cross that was coming in a few days, but he was also very certain of the glory of what the cross was going to mean. And again, the reason why he was confident was that just as he was confident in the love of God, he was confident of the sin of man, but he knew that in the end, that the love of God would conquer the sin and to conquer the sin for us because he loves us. He loves us this morning.